Casual Birder Podcast, a weekly podcast for people interested in the birds they find around them. I'm Susie Buttress. As a casual birder, I look for opportunities to watch birds as I go about my daily tasks. Join me each week as I talk about the various birds I've seen or speak with others about their experiences. This week, I talk with Ewan Buchan, the Edinburgh bird watcher. I started following Ewan's Instagram account earlier this year and noticed we were having many similar experiences with our garden birds. I was really pleased to have the opportunity to find out more about the birds Ewan sees and how he came to be a bird watcher. Welcome to the Casual Birder podcast, Ewan. It's lovely to speak to you. It's a pleasure to be here. I found you first on Instagram, uh-huh. posting the photos of birds that you were seeing. And we had some similar experiences, um, unfortunately, with our nesting birds this year. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, it, was, it was quite a sad thing, unfortunately, but it was quite exciting when they actually, when I put the TV on and there was a great touch in the box. Said, oh, oh, good, they're coming back. I didn't think they were coming back. Was, they were quite late coming back this year. So I went to work that day and I just left them to it and... When I came back home, this little nest is getting bigger and bigger. And then a couple of weeks later, I noticed an egg. And I thought, oh, that's pretty good. And then all of a sudden, it disappeared. I thought, where's it gone? But the parents were really good at covering the, the eggs because um, last year we kept having a bee coming in. So, oh, God, I'll, be, I'll put them off. Oh. But something, yeah. And sometimes the, bee, the parent would come in and pick the bee up and, and take it outside. But for some reason, I, didn't, I don't know why they didn't... Um, eat the, the bee, but they just, they just took it out, but the bee would keep coming in and out, but well, I couldn't get the bee to come in too much this year, but, but when, once the chicks were quite grown up, I think they were so weak, they didn't try and eat the bee themselves, and yeah, and then suddenly they just all died, it was really terrible. Yeah, perhaps I shouldn't have opened on this story, because it, it was a bit tragic for both of us. Um, but it's interesting to hear about uh, you having a bee come into the box, because we've had that as well, and I've never been really sure whether the bees will coexist in the box, because it's just one bee. Yeah. It's not like it brings a swarm with it, and they seem to be up near the roof of the box. Yeah. But you say that your great tits did actually actively take the bee out or push the bee out of the box. They didn't do it much this time, but... They went away quite a long, long time. I was getting a bit worried. They did return, but they weren't as active as they were last year. Mm. I don't know why that was, but yeah. they were just looking for food. But yeah, so it was a, a bit of a sad outcome for both of us. But as you, um, as you said, when they first start going in the box, it's really exciting to, to watch the nest being built and to see what effort goes into it. Yeah. When you've got your next box camera on, do you monitor all the time or do you just go to it every now and then and put it through your TV? Well, sometimes, sometimes I just keep the TV on all day. <laughs> there's nothing. There's nothing on TV. Right? Anyway, <laughs> so, so watch the box. <laughs> yeah, just keep just keep it on. Yeah, and I just wonder what's going kind of, see all the different objects they bring in. But yeah, it's always interesting to watch them come in and out and have a wee rest. Or sometimes the mum would just sit and the dad would come and feed her and disappear again. And sometimes it's quite difficult to tell which is which if they're taking in turns. But I think it's mostly the female that sits on the eggs. Yeah, I've. Um I think I might be moving more towards the possibility of having a feeder camera uh, set up with a continuous feed rather than the Nest Box one. Yeah. Because I just, I'm too tender hearted when it comes to the outcome. I think we've had four broods now over the years, two successful and two not. So I might, yeah. I might just leave the Nest Box up and let, let it happen. I'll see how I feel next year. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe been a bad year for it. Could be a better year next year. So oh, absolutely. fingers crossed. Yeah, no, absolutely. One of the things I wanted to ask you is uh, how you got into bird watching and how you got into deciding to photograph the birds and, and share those photos online. Um, well, actually, I started into bugs, I was into insects, and um, mainly ladybirds and slaters. But even though woodlice, everyone called them slaters back then. But I was always really interested in ladybirds and would go into. <laughs> go into neighbours' gardens and look at, look at their hedges and look for ladybirds, which they were not too pleased about. <laughs> and, yeah, yeah, and then got so many jam jars from my grandparents and just every time I find a ladybird, just pop them in and put leaves in and leave them and, unfortunately, just let them die. Unfortunately, I was, I was terrible at 
letting them go and felt I was quite interested in, interested in studying them. And then when one day I just noticed birding with Bill Lodi on the TV and I got really interested in his enthusiasm and my grandpa built a nest box which birds didn't actually go to and then yeah, but it wasn't until um, 2002 when I actually got into it properly. And that's it, I've been birding ever since. Oh, it's interesting that you uh, you cite Bilodi as being an interest when you were a child, because he was certainly a childhood hero of mine, um, first of all from the comedy series The Goodies, and uh-huh. I was already into birding, but when I found out that he was into birding too, it was like the first adult that I'd known that liked birds. Yeah, it was basically... Um, his Go Wild program for actually made me interested again. It was like I lost interest in it for a while and then just got back into it after this series came back. So. Right. And what, what form does your bird watching take? Um, it's basically just um, casual and active. I, I, I go birding most um, weekends or weekdays when I'm, when I'm off work, so it's, it's pretty chilled birding. Whereabouts in Scotland do you live? Uh, Edinburgh, so it's, it's in the middle, east coast, yeah. Yeah, so what, what kind of birds do you have locally that may be a little bit more specific to the area? Um, well, we've got um, great spotted woodpeckers. He's a, a local to my garden. And blue tits and uh, herons, Canada geese occasionally, and the odd grey leg geese, and pretty much all the common birds that we all know. I'm very jealous of your woodpeckers, I have to say. <laughs> yes, yes. It's not, it's not most of the female that arrives, but... The male comes occasionally, and I've never seen the, the checks once. I come to the feeder, but yeah. Does your garden back onto woodland? No, it doesn't. It's just a bit of the garden. But there is wood. There is woodland nearby, which I which I go to occasionally. It's quite a good place for birding around the area. And do you have like a a set sort of patch, an area that you feel is yours for birding that you you've got to know the birds over the years? Um, well, I've got I've got a place called Camel, which is about five minute walk away and uh, a nice little woodland which I actually went to when I was quite little. I had so many childhood memories going tadpoling and but it is a great place for birding and you can and dog walking as well back and escape from the crowd and be in my own nature world and listen to the birds when they do sing because it can be very quiet days and you can't hear anything but it's a it's a great place And when you when you go out birding, is is there a particular time of day that you go or is it can it be quite varied? It can be quite varied, but it's normally in the afternoon time I, I tend to go, but I would like to try and be a bit more active and go in the mornings, which I, I do kind of look at the birds when I'm walking to work, so afternoon time is most, most of the time I go out. Sometimes I go on the bus and go further afield. Are you near any of the coasts where you are? Yeah, I go regularly to um, North Berwick and look at the, the seabirds and visit the Scottish Seabird Centre. It was a, a great attraction, which I'd totally recommend if anyone comes up here. Yeah, absolutely. They got the occasional boat trips up to the Bash Rock, which I've been to, which is absolutely fantastic. The smell and the sight is absolutely breathtaking. I'd, I would recommend that to anyone. It's one of my favourite places I've ever gone to. So Bass Rock, isn't that one of the big gannet colonies? It is, yeah. yeah. Um, I remember talking about that when, uh, when I had my gannet episode. And... Um, yeah, I, I I haven't yet been there, but that's one of the places I would like to go. Now, you've travelled around Scotland a little, and I know you've just recently been to um, the Outer Hebrides. Um, yeah. Can you say the name of the island that you've been to? Oh, uh, well, Ben Bickler is the main one, because we've got family connections there, and I think the family would be really interested in mention that, because they like the Hebrides, and so do I. But we go to North Uist and South Uist and Eriski, Barrow we've been to before, but not we don't go very often. But yeah, North North and South Uist and Benbeck is the main place that I go to. And we we went on a, a backpacking holiday in our youth um, on the Outer Hebrides and uh, and visited those islands too. Um, but I know that this time you didn't have fantastic weather while you were out. But what kind of birds did you see while you were out there? Um, well, we saw um, well lots of grey light geese. That's always you can hear them in the mornings and. Uh, we saw the usual um, lapwings flying around and oyster catchers, red shanks, curlews, uh, what else? Uh, turnstones. We saw. Oh, wow. Yeah, turnstones. It's always amazing to look at them on the beach running around. And I saw my first ever merlin and hen harrier, which was quite interesting. Oh, wow. So the merlin, how did you come across that? 
Well, we're, we're just driving around um, the nature reserve in Loch Druidebeck, and we're just driving around, and we saw this bird of prey. And I thought, hmm, what's that? It's a bird I'm, no, I'm not familiar with. It's not a buzzard. It's not, it's not a golden eagle. So I thought, hmm, could be a merlin or, or a kesho. Looked up in the book, it was a merlin. So, oh, wow. So, yeah, yeah, so it was quite, quite exciting. And um, was it flying or was it perched? Uh, but they were both. It was um, flying and um, hovering, and then actually landed on the ground. So I managed to get a little film, which I have put it on my Instagram account and Twitter and Facebook pages. So. Oh right, we'll have to look at that. And what's your Instagram account name? The Edinburgh Bird Watcher, just in lowercase. Right, definitely. We'll go, we'll go and look at that, and I'll also put the links into the show notes so people are able to find your photos online. And you mentioned the hen harrier as well, which isn't very common nowadays. More a bird of moorland areas, I think. And whereabouts um, did you see that? It was it was in the fields. We were just driving back home, and then we just saw this grey bird. And I thought it was a seagull at first, but it was actually not. It was a hen harrier. So it was interesting to put it in the notebook. That's, uh, it's interesting you thought it was a seagull at first because um, I saw one in LA or, or Monterey uh, a couple of years ago and um, it just happened that I already had my camera out because I was photographing some sea otters actually in the Moss Landing Bay and, um, and this seagull flew past but as it flew I thought because I'm trying to learn seagulls. Oh, I shouldn't say seagulls. I'm trying to learn all the different gulls. I know, I know. Bad. <laughs> I've just fallen into it myself. I can't believe it. I've just been telling people all weekend, not seagulls. <laughs> I know, I know. Herring gulls or flatback gulls or something. Exactly. Um, anyway, I saw this gull fly past, and there's something unusual. And because I've been trying to learn the gulls, I've been trying to photograph them. So at least if I can't identify them there, I can perhaps look at the photograph afterwards. And as it flew past me, I photographed it, and then realised as it was flying past that it was a, a harrier rather than a gull. And I was like, oh, my gosh, it was gorgeous. And I just managed to get I mean, it was a bit of a blurry picture, so it wasn't a fantastic picture. But it was just the fact that I'd thought it was a gull as well. So it's very interesting that they obviously have a very gull-like shape um, until, yeah, until you look a bit more closely. Well. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So you mentioned that um, when you were younger, you used to watch Go, is it Go Wild or Going Wild? Goes oh, Billardy goes wild. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, what would you say are your first memories of watching birds as a child? Oh, that's a difficult one. I think it was just um, watching a a blackbird in the garden. Oh, it was quite quite a nice bird. And I loved the sound and the colours. It wasn't until years later I didn't realise the the yellow ring around his eye was actually part of the feathers. I thought it was the the full eye itself. Ah. <laughs> yeah. When I realised it didn't doesn't blink. <laughs> I love the calls. That's just like my favourite bird, so that's why I have it as my, my logo. Oh, interesting. Yes, that's right. Um, yeah. You have those in your garden now, do you? Yeah, we do. And there's some apples that have fallen off the tree, so I'll, I guarantee there'll be some blackbirds feeding at it later on. Or... <laughs> in terms of um, feeding in the garden, what, what kind of food do you offer the birds? Um, I've got um, seeds, I've got um, peanuts, I've got um, fat balls and... The ultimate favourite, the coconut, which is a very favourite for all the birds and especially the woodpecker. And is that just a half a coconut? It's from the RSPV, but they've got the, the string attached, so... Uh, yeah, because I bought some from them that had, was stuffed with suet. Is it the same? Yes, yeah, the suet one. The same one? Yeah. Yeah, I found those to be incredibly attractive to the birds. I, I got a pack of ten of them earlier in the year, and um, they were, I would say, one of the most beloved foods that I'd put out. Yeah. Um, and, and a close second are sunflower hearts in my garden. I find that sunflower hearts are eaten by almost all the birds that come into the garden. Do you have any um, specific birds going to specific feeders, or do they seem to be quite generally they'll go to any of the feeders that are around? Yeah, I've got, well, I've got, in, I've got a bush, and they've got um, two feeders ne- next to each other, and they're both, they're both seeds, and they all seem to go to, one, go to the smallest one, which is like a plasticky one. And uh, they just they just go for it, and it's always empty within an hour after I've filled it. Wow. It's interesting. What's the style of the other feeder? Well, it's just a, a squirrel-proof feeder. So is it a metal one? It, it's a metal one, yeah, and the, the other one's just it's plastic. Excluding this, the coconut feeder, I've got um, two cage feeders and uh, just one that isn't cage. So I think, I think they like the one without the cage so they can get to go to it quickly. Yeah, isn't that interesting? Because uh, I've had a couple of questions in the last week about... 
uh, people putting food out and, and not getting any birds to them yet. And um, it's interesting that some birds might also have a preference for a type of feeder as well as the food that you put in it. Yeah. Um, I'll have to look more closely at the ones in my garden because I've got a variety of feeders out there, or I did have. I'll be putting them back out shortly. I took them down because I had uh, some green finches that were very poorly. And um, the advice is to stop feeding for a few weeks when, when that happens, um, just so that you don't let the other birds catch the illness that the green finches have. You're lucky you get them. I don't really get very really gold finches anymore. A green finch. Green finches. Yeah. No, I went. I went through a period, and I think they did suffer a few years ago with a really big outbreak of this disease, and the population levels dropped. So I had a few years where I wasn't getting them, and then this year in particular, I've had like six or seven birds in the garden at once, which is a little bit unusual for me. I've, I've had, you know, I get them in twos and threes, mm-hmm. but this year I've definitely had a lot more around. So it's quite hard to have to stop feeding them. So I decided to put just one small feeder out, just a two-port feeder with sunflower seeds. Um, and I've I scattered a few seeds down in a feeding tray on the ground because I've still got the partridge coming to the garden. Oh, wow. And I wanted to make sure that she had something. I mean, this I, that partridge is just so surprising to me that, um, first of all, that it turned up with its partner um, back in April. And I just thought it would literally be there for that hour, just passing through and be gone. And um, and she's been there ever since. The the male disappeared um, after about four weeks, but she's still been coming round. I've been concerned about the cats because there's quite a lot of cats in the neighbourhood. Uh, and also, yeah. um, I recently found out that sparrowhawks will also take a red leg partridge. So um, because they they'll take birds up to sort of coloured dove size, and they might even try to take a wood pigeon. But I think a wood pigeon would be quite difficult. Yeah. Because the um, partridge is about midway between the two, I'm now, I'm now concerned that the sparrowhawk is going to go for the, the bread leg partridge. But um, there's not a lot I can do to protect her. It's just, you know, it's going to have to be one of those situations. If that's what happens, that's what happens. It's funny you mentioned the sparrowhawk. Was actually, last time I ever saw a sparrowhawk, it was actually feeding on a dead wood pigeon. It was oh. there for, for a couple of hours. So, yes, they could take a wood pigeon if. If they managed to. Is that was it a was it the female sparrowhawk? So was it a browner coloured sparrowhawk? Because the um, the female's slightly larger than the male, so the male's the one with the sort of grey feathers and the russet tummy. I think it was. The, I think it was the male. It was a couple of years oh, ago. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah, it was there for a couple of hours. It was, it's just stopped what I was doing. Just looked out the windows, watched it plucking its feathers. It was. Not a very nice sight to look at, but it was interesting to look at. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I've I've been in the same situation where it's it's hard to see it happen, but at the same time, it, it is a predator eating prey, which is how they survive. Do you have any other animals visiting your garden? Um, we have had had foxes in the past, but I've never actually seen it myself. And um, years ago, we had a, a hedgehog, and um, but that's the only hedgehog we've ever had in the garden. Oh really? Yeah, yeah. We've um we've got a few hedgehogs at the moment, and I'm seriously contemplating getting a hedgehog home for them to to stay in over winter. Yeah. Um, it, it's because it's quite scary hearing the foxes at night. You can hear them barking, and it can be quite an eerie sound. Yeah, and I think the scree- they do a sort of scream as well, don't they? Which can be really yeah. blood curdling. Yeah, and occasionally we hear the the odd um, Tony owl, but. I had one for a couple of years actually, it was just a shame. Yeah, I was going to ask you about if you had any owls in the garden. Are there any birds that you've um, noticed the behaviours of that have been something that perhaps you might not have expected? Um, well, it was, well it was when we had the, the beast from the east uh, at the beginning of the year, we had a, a field fair in the garden, and it was quite, that was quite a difficult bird to photograph at, at one stage as well, but it was also darting around. But it was interesting to watch it, um, well, try to go for other birds or not. Maybe not go for them, but just chasing them off. It was just, as I said before, it's been a long time since I last saw a field fair, and it was quite interesting to watch them just run for other different birds. That same time was the first time I had a field fair in the garden as well. Um, so I, I quickly put some apples out for them to, <laughs> to give them <laughs> some, some food. Um, yeah, I guess that it was such a hard winter that um, if they find a food source, they're going to try and defend it against other birds so that they protect it for themselves. Have you got any birds that you absolutely would love to see that you haven't yet seen? 
Um, I like to have more goldfinches and actually visit my garden. I do see them on top of the the tree above my garden, but they never actually fly down to the, <laughs> never fly down to the feeders. Yeah, I'd like to have more finchy kind of birds, and I'd li- I'd like to see a, a green woodpecker visit the garden, which would be interesting. Oh, that would be good. I've never seen a green woodpecker. Oh, have you not? No, never ever seen a green woodpecker. Have you heard them? No, nope, I've never heard them. I've never. I don't know. If, I don't think they're in our area. Uh, you saying about the goldfinches? Do you put out sunflower hearts? I haven't actually tried that yet. I mean, I mean, I should try. And... Yeah, because in my garden, they're they're like the most commonly enjoyed seed, and the uh, goldfinches are all over those. Yeah. So the fact that you've got goldfinches in the trees above your garden might be worth putting out some sunflower seeds in a small feeder just to just to try yeah. it out. But the hearts, yeah. you know. Yeah. I haven't got enough trees to put on another feeder. Is. <laughs> oh, oh, maybe maybe where you've got the two seed feeders, where one of them isn't used yeah. as much, maybe try yeah. putting some sunflower hearts in one of those and see what that's happens. That's a good idea. Yeah, that's a good idea. I'll try I'd that. Be interested, yeah, I'd be interested to know if, if you get any success from that. Yeah. Knowing that you've got the goldfinches around, um, it's much easier to get those in the garden than to be in an area where you've not seen them at all. Yeah. And that would be lovely because uh, they are very colourful birds, so it is... It's nice to see those. Yeah. It'll be nice to see the sparrowhawk as well, but I don't see that very often now. No, and they're so quick yeah. as well. But I think they patrol quite regularly when they've got a patch where they know they can they can get birds. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's possible that they're patrolling nearby, but they're just not actually stopping. We did have a we did we used to have a pond, but we we got rid of it for a, a greenhouse, and we did actually get um, a heron actually visit visit it because we used, oh. we used to have fish. And um, I did buy one of these um, plastic herons, which people always think it, it scares off herons, but it doesn't. <laughs> was that? Is it more like attracting the heron in? <laughs> yeah, I think so, because um, I remember I was looking out the window and I thought, oh, my parents have bought me another plastic heron, but then it moved. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but normally you see it on my neighbour's house. They're big yeah. birds to see in an urban environment. Yes, aren't they? they are. But I, I think they lost interest once we got rid of the fish. Yeah. Yeah. We, did, we did actually have tadpoles at, at one stage. I was looking forward to watching the, the progress, but then they were all gone. It was, oh, no, blooming heron. <laughs> Do you think the heron hit, ate the tadpoles as well? I think so. We didn't, we didn't actually see him eat, eat the same things, but we kind of guessed that. Yeah, I guess. It, I suppose it makes sense. Yeah. Were there um, any other bird stories that you wanted to tell the listeners? Well, I can talk about my, the last twitch. If, if that oh, yes, yes, please. Yeah, but um, a couple of years ago, I was on Twitter and I saw um, people were looking for looking for the mandarin duck. You know the mandarin yes. duck. Yes. Um, I that was my bogey bird. But every time I went to the to the location to look for it, I never saw never saw the duck. Oh. Even though I stayed for a long, long time, just there was no sighting of it. Then one October, someone post, posted that they saw it at a place called um, Blackford Pond, which I go to occasionally. And uh, so I went, and boom, there it was, right in front of me. So I thought, fantastic. So I had to take a couple of pictures and videos, and it, that was a, a great experience. Everyone was, everyone was just feeding the, the usual mouths. They didn't actually pay attention to the Mandarin duck, which I think was a much more impressive duck that day. It brightened up my day, I can tell you. <laughs> yeah, because they're fantastic colouring, aren't they? Yes, yeah. Do you record the sightings of birds that you see and upload it to anything like eBird or a BTO Birdwatch or anything like that? No, I don't do any of that. I just, I just upload them on my YouTube and then just post them on my Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. I do the, the Garden Birdwatch. That's the only account I do in January, which is good fun. I've just joined um, the BTO again. What they did was sent me a pack for um, doing uh, a bird watch in the garden. So. Um, oh, yes, yes. I heard of that one. Because um, I'm always standing there looking out at the birds anyway, so I might as well note them and, and pass the information back to help with the sort of citizen science aspect of it. And I'll probably keep talking about it on <laughs> on the show. <laughs> yeah. Have you got any bird that you've seen that um, is like an all-time best for you? Um, it's, well, it's always been the woodpecker. Always brightens up my day, even if it's a, a wet day like today. It, it just brightens up my day of looking at the garden. Anyway, I just like looking at birds anyway. It always brighten up my day anyway, even if it's a horrible day or if I'm feeling low. I just like looking at just looking at them. In fact, I, even in my room, I've got a poster saying "Keep calm and keep birding." That always keeps me motivated. Yes, yes. When I'm birding, I find it definitely gives me a moment away from 
like worrying about stuff that's going on generally or you know just being stressed out and I can just watch birds and just be totally relaxed watching them oh absolutely I do that as well yes it's just nice to get away from human company and just be on your own and be with your feathered friends that describes it so well um and it's not that we hate other people (laughs) (laughs) but it's just there's something about being alone with the birds yes I'm really pleased that we, we connected because um, it seems like we have lots of uh, very similar experiences yeah. um, with the birds that we see. Thank you so much for having time to speak with me uh, today, Ewan. It's, it's been really nice talking to you. It's been a pleasure. And I look forward to seeing more of your photographs through the winter from the Edinburgh Bird Watcher. I really enjoyed speaking with Ewan and hearing his tales. I'm delighted to report that since speaking with him... He has posted photos in the Casual Birder Facebook group of the great tit roosting overnight in his bird box. Could this mean that they'll nest in there again next year? And of goldfinches that have finally visited his feeders. Do follow Ewan on Twitter at edinbirdwatcher or visit his website at theedinburghbirdwatcher.com to see his photos and blog posts. You can find the links to his Instagram and YouTube channels there and I'll also include all these links in the show notes. several short bird walks this week hoping to record some songs and sightings for the show they didn't quite work out as I'd hoped but here's one of the walks I did and there was a little bonus at the end when I got back home I've come out for a stroll on a sports field near where I live Um, the field is surrounded by bushes and trees and so I'm having a walk around the margin just to see what birds might be around I've tried several times this week to do a bird walk. I tried in the car park at work and in my garden. And each time I managed to pick times when, while there were some birds around, they weren't really being vocal. And so I was left just describing for you the birds with nothing much really to share with you. So I can hear some long-tailed tits nearby, a few trees over. There was a wood pigeon calling just now and I can hear a robin in the distance. So there's a flock of about 10 long-tailed tits in that little group. There's several wood pigeons high up in the trees. It's a very overcast afternoon. They promised a sunshine, but that didn't materialise. There's wood pigeons up in this oak tree above me. It's a really tall oak tree. And I think the wood pigeons are pulling acorns off the tree. Probably get one on my head in a minute when they drop one. So I'm standing on this path in a little bit of scrubland here. And above the traffic noise... I can still hear the calls of the long tail tits. I heard a magpie way off in the distance then. Lots of wood pigeons, but they're being very silent and just eating the acorns. But it's wonderful how many birds are around. I can hear a robin singing still. So I just thought I'd come out for five or ten minutes, just have a little stroll see what birds it's possible to see. So from where I'm standing at the moment there are I would say between 15 and 20 wood pigeons in the tops of the trees. Really are the most frequent bird around here. It's going to be some great sounds now as I walk up a cobbled path or a shingled path I should say. I feel like I'm recording sounds for an audio drama. So it's only a short bird stroll but in that time I saw a lot of wood pigeons I can still see them now actually pulling the acorns off the oak tree I saw a flock of long tail tits I saw a blue tit and great tit I heard a robin I saw the magpies I saw a couple of feral pigeons and some carrion crow so I think that's almost the end for my bird walk the uh, sky is getting very grey now it's quite cool 
cool out for this late September afternoon. Well, that was quite a list that I saw, just of walking around a small field. And you could look at that field and think there's nothing there. So it's quite reassuring about how many birds you can see in just a very short space of time. I just got home and there were lots and lots of house sparrows calling out. So I thought I'd come over and record them. It's just delightful to hear so many house sparrows together chattering away. It always feels like they're talking about what's happened during the day and gossiping for the evening, catching up on the news. I'm very happy to hear them anyway. A couple of episodes ago, I told you about my colleague Hannah, who wanted to attract birds to her garden. In particular, she'd been given a decorative feeder in the shape of a cup and saucer and she wanted to know how to get the birds to come and feed there. I advised her that rather than putting the feeder close to the house straight away, especially as she had not been feeding the birds previously, she should put it near the shrubs further down her garden and let the birds get used to finding food there before moving it closer to the house. Having it near the shrubs would provide cover for the birds to help them feel protected from predators. Unfortunately, the teacup and saucer feeder didn't stand up to being outside, However, she found another feeder and tried my suggestions and I was really happy when she told me this week that she had had blue tits visiting the feeder and has seen a robin in the garden. I look forward to hearing more about the birds that come to feed there. I'd love to know what birds you've seen this week. Join our Facebook group to discuss this week's episode or post your photos of the birds you've seen. I really do enjoy hearing your tales so come and join the conversation there. Find us at facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash casual birder podcast. Follow me on Twitter at casual birder pod or on Instagram at casual birder podcast. And you can email me at casual pod at gmail.com. Make sure you don't miss any episodes by subscribing to the show. Subscribing is free and you can do it wherever you listen to the show. If you enjoy the show, please consider sharing tweets and posts about the show on social media to help other people find it. Thank you to Randy Braun for designing the artwork for the show. The theme music is Short Sleeve Shirt by The Drones. Thanks to them for letting me use it. And check out their website at www.dronesmusic.net. Thank you all for listening. And I hope you'll join me again for another episode of The Casual Birder Podcast. Podcast.